Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. You know, speaking with a friend the other day, he brought up how thankful he was that God would forgive all the bad stuff he'd done in his life. And like many of us, he reminds himself of that very thing from time to time. Of course, there's a spiritual dynamic at play here in that, on the one hand, remembering those former stains on his soul keeps him and us humble, but on the other hand, it can also keep him in a sort of bondage of uncertainty. Now, let me explain. This is possibly because he's not grasping the big picture, so to speak. Now, honest comprehension of the wickedness of our sin and sin nature is indeed fundamental to the honest reception of God's gracious forgiveness and the honest appreciation of what Jesus did for us on the cross and, of course, his following resurrection. However, knowing this, the enemy of our souls tries to short-circuit, if you would, this process in at least a couple of ways. First, in speaking to our heart, he tries to transform that honest comprehension into deceptive condemnation. Thus, we can shy away from embracing God's forgiveness, even though we may give lip service to it. Now, there are many, many who are sitting in pews today who are in this position. In addition, he tries to convince us that just as we cannot truly forget our misdeeds, neither does God. Well, because of this, many, many sincere Christians are expecting to get the so-called woodshed talk from God in heaven, and thus are apprehensive as opposed to appreciative and adoring. You see, it all comes down to simple faith. Can you truly believe that Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection demonstrated the depth of God's love for you? And can you believe that contrary to the lies of Satan, God's nature and intent is completely forgiving, welcoming, and all so many good things toward you in spite of knowing all about you. Now, many, many preachers like to talk about the beautiful process of sanctification, but they frequently confuse it with self-imposed moral codes somehow tied to biblical law. Now, that's too bad, because a real purpose of sanctification is to grow us up, so to speak, into the full stature of godly men and women. It is totally a work of the Holy Spirit in us, growing our faith in the faithfulness of our Lord. The do's and don'ts of those moral codes don't sanctify us. The faith that draws us closer to Him does. The natural obedience to his will is the fruit or the consequence of that sanctification process. So where does this kind of faith come from? I'll answer that in a moment. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in that verse, there's a type of spiritual legal proceeding pictured that takes place concerning each of us, with Father God, if you would, presiding. Jesus is our defense attorney, and the devil is a sort of prosecutor. Now, don't take this too literally, but understand something very important to your spiritual well-being fundamental to the operation of the entire cosmos, seen and unseen, is that God is just. You see, he could not tell us that sin will kill us and then simply say later that, well, he changed his mind. See, Malachi 3, 6, and 7. That would be unjust. Neither can he say 
that he lied about sin because he cannot lie. See Numbers 23.19. So then, our continual rebellion against his ways, we lie, we cheat, we kill, we steal, we're selfish, we deceive, on and on it goes, establishes an enormous debt that must be paid if we are to be free. We don't get just to walk away from it, or we ourselves don't have the resources to pay for it apart even from our own lives. Hmm. In view of all creation, God must show himself to be just. But at the same time, he must remain true to his other character traits of mercy, kindness, and love. Well, enter Jesus Christ, the perfect man who never sinned. He resisted the devil's temptations and lived a life of selfless good. He offered himself up as the payment before God and before the cosmos. His life, sacrificed for us, canceled all debt of sin, beginning with Adam and extending to all his descendants, everyone, every sin, for all time, past, present, and future. God won't force anyone to accept this amazing provision. Sure, it's a glorious manifestation of the greatest gift of love ever. Sure, any sane person would gladly receive it. Sure, life beats death all day, every day. But God knows that if it is forced on us, then our gratitude is also forced and not real. Therefore, we all have a choice to believe and receive this gift of complete forgiveness and life eternal, or to doubt and die. So to believe and receive, all we need to do is demonstrate that we know we are on trial, so to speak, and justly so. We deserve it. We've sinned, and there's no escaping that fact. That is, we need to confess our failures to God. So that takes us back to 1 John 1, nine. There are at least three more main points to consider and appreciate in this beautiful truth. First, in that verse, the word forgive means to send away. Satan wants to use our sins as a club to continually beat us and keep us under his thumb. But God sends them away. Where? As far from us as east is from west. See Psalms 103.12. And by the way, that's infinitely far away, never to return. Second, the word in that verse, cleanse, means to clean the slate. There's no residue, no leftovers, nada. So, there's nothing for him to remember. Like they, your sins never happened. No, they're not on a shelf somewhere that they're going to pull out later His word cleanse means they simply don't exist anymore, not in his mind or, with time, in yours. Third, in that verse, unrighteousness means unlawful acts. You see, his promise is to clean the slate from all unlawful acts. Now, these are the consequences of living sinfully. You see, your sin invariably has ugly impacts upon yourself and others. And sometimes you don't even know about it or see it. But God sees it all, and he has committed to make it all right. Now, faith to believe all this is simply a gift from God. So ask him for it. If you're coming up short, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by Grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Let that sink in. So God's promise is to utterly forgive and to fix or make right everything you've messed up when you confess your need and failures and with his generous gift of faith to believe. What an outrageously good God. Now may the Lord grant you peace in the midst of any storm, and faith to trust him. 
Look for our next podcast, and may you realize more of His grace today.